to be in church, turn to the person next to you and tell them it's so good to see you today. Let's get ready to have a great time in God's presence. Amen. Let's sing it out all together. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Come on, all together. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Come on, Rio.
church and whether you've been connected with us in person or online um, we are praying and believing that God is meeting you exactly where you're at and so today we start officially our last week this is our last week we're gonna have a big uh, closing time yeah. of prayer next Saturday so we invite you to be with us from 9 to 10 uh, but today day 15 our uh, devotional is uh, talking about how we have protection when we pray we can pray for protection Amen. right we are protected by prayer and so I want to share this scripture uh, with you that it's in 2nd Samuel 22 starts in verse 2 so really easy right 2 2nd Samuel 22, 22 verse 2 it says this is David uh, writes this this song to the Lord he says the Lord is my rock my fortress and my deliverer Amen. my he, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation he is my stronghold my refuge and my savior from violent people you save me I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and he, and have been saved from my enemies so beautiful right we see so many words there that describe who our God is and he is a God that delights in protecting us he is our protector right he is our rock he's our fortress yeah. he is our salvation and our refuge and so um, I just want to encourage you no matter what situation you may be going through trust that God can protect you that he delights when we seek him for that refuge when we find rest in him when we trust in him as we were singing today Lord I trust in you I need you and so as we pray right now we're gonna take just a moment to all pray together let's tell him that we we trust him let's that's how yeah. we need him to be our refuge and our strong tower and our, our shield and um, we also have our prayer focus that is praying for our needs so I want to encourage you whatever needs you have Whatever they may be, lay them before God right now and pray. Just, just give them to the Lord in prayer. The Word of God says that before we open our mouths to speak, He already knows what we need. Amen? So let's pray together. Lord, we just come yes, before you, Lord, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus. Yes, we Lord. thank you that we can come to you, and we thank you that you hear our prayers, and we thank you, God, that we can trust you for protection, God. Amen. And so just as David wrote in this scripture, Lord, we, we say to you that you are our rock that you are our deliverer, that you are our strong tower and our salvation, Lord. You are our salvation. And so I pray, God, that you would continue to protect us, Lord. Would you protect our physical bodies? Would you protect our hearts and our minds, God? Would you guard us? Would you protect our families and our marriages, Lord? Would you protect our church, Lord? We pray for your protection over this church family, God. We pray for protection over our schools, Lord, for our community, God, for our cities, Lord. Just lift up your, your city wherever you live lift yes, it up to the lord right now god we ask for your protection over our cities lord for for the state of florida lord we for our nation lord we pray for your protection and god we also come to you with all of our needs lord not from the smallest need to the biggest need the things that seem impossible we just lay them before you and trust in you that they are in your hands god that your grace is sufficient lord and that you will provide our needs in your perfect timing God and so we just tell you Lord that we love you that we trust in you and we put the rest of this service in your hands in Jesus name we pray amen amen amen, amen, amen. hey welcome to vertical church everybody if you're new here my name is Verge this is my wife just Lane. we're the pastors here at vertical church help me out vertical church exists to point people up to God teach them to follow Jesus and equip them to make a difference we are one church Two languages, we do everything in English, also in Spanish. Big vision, multicultural, multi-generational, life-giving church that opens up its doors to everybody, believing and declaring God has a plan for you, for you, for you, for you, for everybody's life. Can I get an amen? Yes. Hey, say hello to three or four people that are close by. Bless somebody, encourage somebody, meet somebody, greet somebody, 
And for everybody online, thank you for connecting with us. That's right. If you're connecting with us online, let us know where you are connecting from. We love to hear uh, about where you're, where you are, whether you're in town, whether you're in the state, or even somewhere around the world. We love to get to know you. And we want to take this opportunity and give a special, special welcome for those that are visiting us for the first time today. So if you're here for the first time in person, or maybe you're connecting online for the first time, thank you so much for, for taking this time to be with us. We really are praying and believing that God has something very special for you today. And so uh, we would love to get to know you, and the best way to do that is by completing a, or filling out a connection card. If you're here in person, you're going to find that connection card in the seat back pocket right in front of you. You can also get one digitally if you text the word Vertical Life. Make sure you do it all together with no spaces, Vertical Life, to the number 94,000. And that information is going to get sent directly to your phone. Um, and at the end of the service, when you walk out, if you're here for the first time, make sure to stop by a green tent. Our hospitality team is there ready to welcome you, uh, answer any questions you may have. And if you hand them that connection card, let them know you're here for the first time. They have a special gift for you on behalf of us. Hey, I, I don't know what different things you're looking for. But for example, if you say, you know, I'm looking for a place for coffee, right? What would we say? Hey. There's Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, Filomena's is right here on the corner. Maybe you know a coffee shop. You could send them that way, right? Or somebody might say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in uh, a computer. You know, you might send them to the Apple Store or you might send them to Brand Smart, you know. And, and here's, my, here's my statement, right? If you're looking for a spiritual family, you came to the right place. Because here at Vertical, we believe that a church is not a building you walk into, but rather a family you belong to. So we're not comparing church or the Lord or Christianity to, uh, to uh, an item, you know, or a thing. You, but we're saying you go to a place for a certain reason. And, and this is a place you come to to find a spiritual family, to know God, to grow in God, and to take steps in your faith. So we're so happy to be here. By the way, we are a family that's on mission. This, we have mission. We have vision. And let me say two things. To those of you who are new and visiting us, you are welcome here and you whatever is most convenient for you connect with us if you're part of this church family we're asking you to help us with a missional move maybe once a month maybe twice a month what is the missional move a missional move from this service maybe once a month say hey i'm going to come to the 5 p.m english service here's the deal 5 p.m and 5 p.m english 7 p.m spanish are newer services and they are they're less attended look around right now just look around just look around our ushers are having trouble seating people, right? This is a good problem for church. Yeah. It's a good problem for church, right? And we love it. And so, and so to those of you who are part of our impact team, for those of you who believe in that vision and mission of this house and are running with us, I want to encourage you to pray about and consider maybe one Sunday a month saying, hey, I'm going to come at 5 p.m., clear up some space at 1045 for some friends and neighbors to come that need Jesus, that don't know Jesus, and I'm going to make a missional move doing this with my family at once a month, twice a month, whatever it is, whatever the Lord puts in your heart. But let's think about others, right? Not just what, what do I want, what's most convenient for me. If you're new, if you're visiting, whenever you want. If you're part of this home, let's be part of the mission. Amen? Amen. We got, I have, I have such a message, yeah. such a message for you today. You're working hard. I am a witness. I'm working gonna, hard I'm going to sweat a lot, this <laughs> message. Get ready. Before we get to the message, take a look at Vertical News. Hello Vertical, it is another beautiful Sunday. We are excited that you are here in person and connected online. My name is Adriana and this is Vertical News. Today we have step three of our growth track. The growth track consists of four steps that we offer each month to help you know who we are and how you can be a part of the spiritual family. In step three, you will dive into the details of your personality, discover your gifts, See how your design reveals your purpose in life and your best fit in ministry. We invite you to step three in person at 2.30 p.m. Just make sure to text the word Vertical Life to the number 94,000 to register, or you can visit our website, verticalchurch.com, for more details. We believe life transformation happens in the context of relationships. The way we love to do this here at Vertical is through life groups, and our fall season starts soon. So to all of those who will be leading a life group this season, make sure you register your group as soon as possible. You can do this by visiting our website, verticalchurch.com. We encourage you to get connected to one of our life groups. The directory will be open next Sunday. 
And this is our final week of our 21 days of prayer, and we encourage you to join us. It is not too late. This is a time where we connect with God through prayer. We are meeting in person here at church every morning from 6 to 7 a.m. and on Saturdays at 9 a.m. We will end this amazing 21 days of prayer with a powerful time of worship and prayer, so don't miss out. That's all we have for Vertical News. Church, let's get ready for a powerful message and let's take a look at the following video. All right, all right. Take out your Bibles, everybody. Come on, lift it up if you're proud of your sword. I want a Bible in every person's hand. Hey, I know we're human. It's life. Maybe you're a visitor. Maybe you're a guest. Maybe you forgot. You left it in your car. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Ushers are going to get them to you right now. Every person has a Bible in their hand. If you need a Bible, raise it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are getting into part two of our series. Hey, I'm going to do some trivia from last week while everybody gets a Bible handed to them. Question, how many testaments in the Bible? What are they called? <clears throat> Old Testament and New Testament. All right. L last week we talked about Bible basics. Live it, learn it, love it, right? Okay, so here is my next question. Next question. Old Testament. Old Testament. What's the first book? All right, listen, Old Testament, what's the last book? Malachi. Malachi, very good, very good. Does anybody remember what the first five books of the Bible are called? <clears throat> the Pentateuch, also known as the books of the law, okay? I want to make sure everybody gets a Bible, everybody gets a Bible. If you don't have one, raise your hand, raise your hand. All right, <clears throat> more trivia. How many books total in the Bible? <clears throat> very good. The New Testament starts with which book? Matthew, ends with which book? All right. What are the first four books of the New Testament called? The Gospels. What are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke. Give yourselves a round of applause. I am so proud. I'm like a proud daddy. I love it. I love it. Hey, some of you, last week is the first time you've ever opened a Bible. Can we give it up? Can we give it up? <clears throat> Literally, I had some friends and some people come and say, Pastor, thank you. I had never opened a Bible. So here's what I want you to do. Open up your Bible to the table of contents. By the way, if, if our ushers brought you a Bible, uh, if, you, if you have a Bible at home, you just forgot it or you didn't know, you didn't bring it, um, you could leave that Bible on your seat after service. Our ushers will pick it up after service. Now, if you don't own a Bible or if you don't have one or if you don't remember that is a gift from Vertical Church to you, okay? So we want you to have God's word. And we love that we can have God's word on our phones and on our devices. Praise God for technology. But there's nothing like those pages sounding in church, which I said last week. I missed hearing the sound of pages turning in church. Um, it's a beautiful thing to know our Bibles. Can, can I just say this? Um, I, we always encourage t also taking notes. You're going to notice uh, new things coming up every once in a while. There's notes. So we have these available for people who, if you want to take notes in service. The other day somebody was writing on a, on a tithe envelope because they didn't have anything to write on. <laughs> you can use these. We're going to make these available. I encourage you to have your own prayer journal that you bring to church with your Bible all the time. That way you keep your conversation with God going. It's a beautiful thing. All right. So here's what I want to say to start off. The Bible is a collection of holy sacred scriptures. It is set apart. The Bible has no rival. What about the diary of Olympia Kid? It, it, the Bible has no rival. It is unmatched. It is the most translated book in the world. We're going to talk about that. It is the most read book in the world. It is the most important book in human history. It is set apart 
as holy and sacred to God. And if we value it and absorb it, it will transform our lives. I learned a younger, a little, a little acrostic for the Bible. Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. And if you want to take a good dip, listen to Burlap to Kashmir, 1999. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Last week we memorized the Bible verse together. I don't want you to seek it out. I want to see if it's still in there. I'm going to start it and you can join me once you remember and then we're going to say the, where you find it in the Bible at the end. Ready? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. Come on, come on. Let's do it one more time. Ready, ready, ready? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalms 119, 105. Give it up, give it up, give it up. Great job. Scripture memory, Bible verse memory. We're going to memorize another one. Are you guys ready? All right, so we're going to do, you don't have to look it up. You could, you could, you could highlight it in your Bible later. Uh, but here it is. Here it is. We're going to read the verse together about two or three times, three times, and then we're going to take it off and we're going to see if we remember it. All right? And at the end we say where we find it in the Bible. Ready? One, two, three. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah 48. Again, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah 48. One more time. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah 48. All right, let's take it off. Let's take it off. Let's take it off. Ready? The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Come on, tell somebody we're killing it. We're killing it. Hey, some of you have two Bible verses memorized. You're catching up to a lot of veteran Christians who've got three. So you get <laughs> God's word. Today we're going to, I'm going to share a, a message entitled Understanding the Bible. Understanding the Bible. Can we just pray? Can we take a moment to pray? Lord, right now we open our hearts. We are ready to receive, to hear, and to learn. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here with us speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray that the that the most knowledgeable and the most veteran of all Christians here today would be able to lean in, learn, enjoy this time. And I pray that the newest person that's maybe their first time in church, Lord, that they would be able to lean in and learn something that helps them. Thank you, Lord, because you have the capability of doing all of that at once. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So I want to do something. Let's go to... Colossians 3. By the way, the table of contents is your friend. Because some of you have no idea where Colossians is. Look there and find Colossians. If you know where it is, then go to it. Question. Colossians. Old Testament or New Testament? Yeah. New Testament. Does anybody know what kind of book it is? It's a Pauline epistle. It's, it's, in other words, it's a letter written by Paul to the church of the Colossians. We're going to Colossians chapter 3. Again, the way we find places in the Bible is by going to the book, finding the chapter, and identifying the verse. You hear the pages, everybody? God's word is being used, you know. I feel like it's like, you know, like Woody and Buzz, like their whole desire is to get played with, right? If our Bibles could talk, they'd be just, open me up. Read me. Memorize me. Colossians 3.16. Some of you already told somebody next to you, I beat you. I know. You got there quick. <clears throat> so, so here it is. Before I read this, let me say this. Uh, we gave a lot of you guys highlighters, right? If you have a highlight, make sure you highlight what we read um, in, in the Word of God. Uh, let me just say this. My prayer as pastor and my responsibility is to help you grow spiritually, uh, is to help you take steps in your walk with God, and the best way that I can do that is pointing you to God himself and to his Word. Uh, so, so check out this verse, Colossians 3.16. I'm, I'm going to be, by the way, I'm going to re be reading from that. NKJV, New King James Version, in this, depending on what Bible you have, it might sound a little different, but the, the concept is there, right? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Pause, pause, pause. I, I'm asking the Lord today, and I'm asking you to consider this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We just did that in worship, right? Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, pause. 
What does it say? Let the word of Christ dwell in you how? Richly in the version I'm reading, right? Let the word of, so I'm telling you today, I want you to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why? Because when the word of God dwells in you richly, you are never the same. When th w there are certain things, when they come into you, you're different. By the way, bad things can make me different in a bad way. But when I allow God's word to dwell in me, and not just like a toe in the pool. You ever seen the people that are like, oh, right? Just jump in. So, so when you want the word of God to dwell in you richly, it means I don't want to just take a dip. I want to remain. I want it to remain in me. All right, so let me give you an illustration. So we got some cups here and some tea. So, all right. Let's say that this cup of water, the water represents your life. It represents my life. And this represents God's word. So what we want to do, what we want to do is we want to let God's word dwell in us richly. But a lot of times what we do is we just allow God's word to dip us. Because we come to Sunday, we read the word. We come to Sunday, another Sunday, the pastor reads something from the Bible. Maybe we listen to a little devotional message, you know, on a drive. Nice, right? Or you say, you know what, I actually want to take a step further. I, I want to come to church on Sunday. Not just one Sunday a month or every two months. I, I want to come consistently. I want, to get, I want to get some dips in. I, I, want to go, I, I want to get in a life group. I want to not, not just read it at, when I'm at church. I want to read it on other days. I want to talk about it. Or, you know what, you know what, I want to come. I want to read it on Monday. I want to read it on Tuesday. I want to talk about it in life group. You know what? I want to give God space, not just how I think. I want to give him room to do what he wants to do. And I want to, I want to let it dwell in me richly. I want to let God's word dwell in me richly. We'll come back to that in a second. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Today I'm going to put on my teacher hat. Everybody say, good morning, Mr. Sierra. Good morning, Mr. Sierra. Good morning class. We are in Bible class. I have this great challenge. It's been, it's been t attention in my heart this whole week. I have invested more hours than I usually do for this message for a lot of reasons. And so I know that some of you have known the Lord for a long time and, and you're going to be like, man, I want to know more about this. Some of you are really new and, and, and I need to kind of convince you that it's worth it to come on this with me. Can I teach you for a little bit? And then I'll come back and preach at you for a little bit. All right? So right now you can kind of pause in the Bible. You can kind of relax a little bit. Like if you're getting tense or you're getting cramps in your fingers, you know, like you relax them. Bible. I want to talk about three dips to get you deeper in God's word. And I'm going to put them up here on the screen. Three dips. Let me show you all three. First, get a translation of the Bible that you understand and you like. That's the first one. Okay? For your note takers, it's a good one. Secondly, you want to take another dip? You don't want to just have like a little, you want to take another dip that goes like, let me get deep, deeper in God's word? Get yourself a study Bible. And I'll talk about that in a second. Or a little bit ahead. And then thirdly, if you want to go even farther, not just having a, a Bible in a translation you like and getting a study Bible, but actually get into a life group where now you're discussing about the Bible with other believers and growing as well. Can I get an amen? amen. By the way, life group's starting up soon, September, September to November, fall season, it's going to be great. All right, let's talk about the first one. Get a translation you understand. You may be wondering if you've ever been in and around church or in and around having a Bible or talking about it with somebody. You may be wondering, what's the deal, Pastor Verge, what's the deal with all the translations and all the versions can they really be accurate? First of all, can I just say one thing? First of all, the Bible wasn't written originally in English. So this is, a, this is a first important thing. Every Bible you hold, unless you speak Greek, New Testament, and Hebrew and Aramaic, Old Testament, you all have to read a translation. Unless you read those original languages. Because the Bible was originally written in primarily in three languages. The Old Testament, the scrolls, and the manuscripts that we have of the originals from back ancient are in Hebrew and Aramaic. And the New Testaments that we have, 
to this day, of those old manuscripts and, uh, and, 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 and sacred writings are actually in Greek. So if you don't speak any of those or read any of those, no matter what you're reading, you're reading a translation <laughs> and you're reading a version, okay? Now, one of the lies that the devil loves to spread into society over thousands of years is that, oh, all those other translations of the Bible have diluted it and they've, it's not accurate and it can't be trusted, but I'm here to tell you today that that is not true. Every, every Bible that we have in the Protestant Christian world are good. They are good. Some of them are different and they vary. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. There is not a diabolical or demonic or horrendous version, okay? We have to be very careful with that. A lot of times people watch videos on YouTube and they, and they discover now that they know the truth. Any fool can put anything on YouTube any day of the week. And so you have to be careful with that. There are groups and people that have come and insisted with an idea. This exists, by the way, I, I had to do the preaching a little different because Bible history is different in Spanish than in English, but then there are some similarities. But both are very similar. But there are people in groups that, that pretty much say that there's only one true. In the Spanish world, they'll say it's the Reina Valera 60. And in the English world, some people say it's only the KJV, King James Version. Depending on how you grew up, depending on what you know about the Bible, you may or may not have heard that. Now, most of the time in the English world, people will say that about the King James Version. Because uh, maybe it's, it's considered, um, you know, the most respected, the most long. Um, so, so I want to just say, praise God. And let me say this. I am in favor of the King James. The King James Version is a wonderful version of the Bible, like many others. Okay? So, so I love the fact that we have the King James Version. And I love the fact that it's the, the Bible that many of our parents and grandparents and probably pastors used if we grew up uh, in church. Okay? Now... The important thing is, the important thing that I want to establish today is there's no such thing as there's only one valid translation and the other ones aren't. And I'm going to explain a little bit about, about this. So I'm going to share with you real quick three criteria for evaluating a Bible translation. I'm going to put it up here. Three criteria for evaluating a Bible translation. Number one, the first criteria is the manuscripts that were used. The second criteria is the process for the translation. And the third criteria is the language and the audience. Okay. Let me delve in. This is, a, this is where a lot of the meat of today's teaching is, okay? Everybody good? Yeah. Everybody say, I'm listening, Mr. Sierra. All right, thank you, thank you. First criteria, the manuscripts. The first criteria when evaluating a translation is what manuscripts did that translation use to do the translation? Um, by the way, the King James Version, you know, back in the day, was a translation from original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic writings. Now, they came from different scrolls and different, you know, papyrus, right, scrolls, things that were used back in those days. Now, what happens is as the centuries went on, new scrolls started appearing in different places at different time in history. Everybody say new scrolls. So, so here's the reality is some scrolls that were available back then weren't available later, even though the ones that were found later were actually more ancient and closer to the originals, more original. So there's a lot here. If you look into Bible history, I'm not going into every detail of everything. I'm just going to kind of hit some of the big points. Bible history. A little bit, there's a little bit of conflict sometimes between those, you know, King James Version only and none of those other contemporary translations. Because what they say is, and they do this, by the way, in Spanish as well. They say, oh, they took out verses of the Bible. For example, people will look at the NIV and say, the New International Version, and say, oh, I don't like that. That's from the devil because they took out verses when that is not a true statement. That is a false statement. Follow me for a second. 280 B.C. What does B.C. mean? 280 before Christ, okay, was the Septuagint. This is when in Alexandria, Egypt, tr they translate the Old Testament from the he original Hebrew into Greek. 381 A.D., okay, we're talking there, you know, 500, 600 years. St. Jerome completes the full Bible in Latin known as the Vulgate, which was used for over a millennium. Everybody say Vulgate. The Vulgate is the, the, the word, the, the Bible that was translated uh, to Latin, 381 by St. Jerome, which for more than a million, millennium was used, by the way, embraced specifically by the Roman Catholic Church in a certain season, 
uh, as the main source, but in Latin. That's why some people have, have sometimes been to a traditional, you know, service in certain types of churches where they're talking or reading things in Latin from the Vulgate, okay? 1380, I know I'm jumping a lot here because there's no time for every little stop, but 1380, John Wycliffe starts a translation from the Latin Vulgate into English, but he's getting himself in a problem because the, the English government, by the way, same thing happened in Spain, the English government as well as the Roman Catholic Church did not want the Bible Vulgate to be translated into the common language of the people because they wanted to remain in control of what they said and how things were established and what they were supposed to follow. That's why so many of the original reform ministers were, they were like, no, this can't be. God's word has to be in everybody's hand. That's why many of them separated. There was a re reformation. We're not happy with this. We are, we are separating ourselves, the, the separation of the Protestant world. So Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, starts a translation from Latin Vulgate to English, but it's not something that everybody's happy about or free because it's got to be hidden because it's not allowed. It's not allowed. Only uh, manuscripts, because there's no uh, printing press yet. 1450, Johann Gutenberg, anybody remember that story? Invents the printing press, which now allows books and writings to be distributed, not just by scribes. By the way, back in the day, and all the ancient scriptures, is scribes. Copy, 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 copy. There was no printing press back in those days. 1450, Johann Gutenberg brings the printing press. That revolutionizes, ma revolutionizes mass communication, literacy, and access to God's word. 1525, William Tyndale. Have you ever heard of Tyndale? William Tyndale translates the Bible from original Greek and Hebrew to English. He has to do this in hiding. By the way, later on, he's killed. He's killed by the religious, and Engli religious institution and the English government for, do for being a traitor for translating the Bible into the language of the people. This people have lost their lives for this sacred book from God. People have given their lives so that we could have God's word in our language. And sometimes I feel like we don't value it. 1534, Martin Luther completes translation of the German language Bible. And we all know his role in the reformation of the church. 1611, a, a bunch of things happened there, in, including uh, 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 Queen Mary, who was known as Bloody Mary, because she was highly, highly Roman Catholic and against anything that was not and anybody that did anything with any Bible, with translation in the language of the people, was murdered. That's why they called her Bloody Mary, which now is the name of a drink, apparently, right? <laughs> then after that, the ruler in England uh, dies, and then the man who is King James VI of Scotland becomes King James I of England. And he is the one who has an open heart and an open mind to the, langu the Bible in, the lang in their lang English language. And King James didn't do it. But what he did is he gathered 54 of the top scholars in all of England to translate the Bible to English. This took the Latin Vulgate and translated it into the language, English. Here's the deal. When King James, which is the KJV King Version, when he did that, okay, we're talking uh, 1600s, he used what he had available. Later... 20th century, 1946, we found the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anybody remember that? The Dead Sea Scrolls. So in other words, they found these sea scrolls or old manuscripts. They're also known as the text of the Qumran. They were found in, by the Dead Sea, and these Dead Sea Scrolls were actually more ancient than the ones that were available to King James and to uh, Casiodoro Reina and Cipriano Valera, who are the two men who did the Reina Valera in Spanish. So, so these scrolls that came out in 1946 weren't available to the 1600 people who wrote the King James Version. They weren't available. They were available now to new scholars, to new Bible ministers and Bibleists, they're called, who translate the Bible. And guess what? The reason why there's differences in the King James Version and the NIV or the NLT and other versions is because criteria number one, they come from different manuscripts. Somebody listening to me? So the people who are like, I'm KJV to death, right? Because that's what it's got to be. By the way, God is in English. God wasn't English or British. or He's not from the 1600s. He's from ever, right? So King James Version has what, what King James scholars put, right? from the Vulgate, then these scrolls come, they make newer translations, but guess what? 
They're not the same manuscript. So King James had these scholars working with this manuscript. Then, 300 and something years later, we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, completely different manuscripts, but they're even older, possibly considered more original from farther back. Scribes. Are you guys with me? So these new translators aren't looking at that translation or that Vulgate or that. They're looking at these manuscripts. So in order to be faithful and precise to these manuscripts, they can't add things to it. So King James people only say the NIV, they took verses out of the Bible. Incorrect. Those verses and those words weren't in these manuscripts. And some might argue that it's not that they took out, it's that these might have put in just because of the traditional uh, values of the day or what gets lost in translation or scribe to scribe because it wasn't a printing press, it was scribe to scribe. So does anybody follow me? So it's not that newer translations took things out, it's that they were being faithful to the manuscripts that they were translating. Okay, all right, so some people are understanding that. Now, I'm going to give you one quick example, and you don't have to look it up, just, just, you can just listen. So for example, Matthew 6, 13 is the end of the Lord's Prayer. Everybody's kind of familiar, you kind of heard, our Father who art in heaven, right? So, so the last verse, 13, in the King James Version says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Same verse in the NIV, New International Version, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, period. It doesn't have, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And remember, King James people say, they took it out of the Bible. NIV people will say, no, it wasn't in the original manuscripts. Could it be that in the Vulgate and from the Roman Catholic influence that they would add thee, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen? Maybe. Could it be that in the scribes, you know, human error, something, to come? it could be, but it's not that it was taken out, it's that it wasn't in the original manuscript. First criteria for evaluating a translation. Has somebody got that? Somebody got that now? Okay. Second criteria is the process. The process of the translation. So question for you, do you think it's more valid if a translation is done by one person or maybe by 20, 30, 40, 50 people? More, more brains that understand and can really interpret and tra translate. So sometimes there are versions that were made by one person. This is part of the process. Another question, do you think it's, it's more valid if, 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 a, if, a, if a project is translated in one year or maybe it's done in a span of five years for study more to find, right? All these are part of the process of a translation. That's why they're not all the same. They're not all created equal. However, all of the Christian Protestant Bibles are good. They're not demonic or diabolical. The ones we would question, Jehovah's Witness Bible, we would question that because there is anti-biblical things in there. We would question uh, certain, certain uh, Roman Catholic Bibles that include other books that are not part of the sacred 66 books of the Bible. And of course, anything with New Age or New World Bibles that bring a lot of things that aren't biblical or godly into it. We would question those. But Protestant Christian Bibles, although there's different translations, we can understand why they might be different. By the way, where was King James from? England. So the guys who worked on it, they were all from 1600 England. Anybody here from 1600 England? Huh? So the interesting thing about the NIV is that they put together, the reason it's called New International Version is because they got together ministers and Bibleists from different nations that speak English, like, like New Zealand, like like South Africa, like the United States of America, like Australia, in addition to English. So now there's a multi understanding that English is a living that's a, it's a living language. It's alive. Spanish is alive as well. Latin is dead. Latin, at one point, Latin died. It finished. There's no more. Uh, English is, a, is a, a, an, an alive language. That's why every year the dictionary has to include new things because it's, it flows from the context of culture. And so phrases that our grandparents said might make no sense today, which, by the way, is the reason why we need versions because there's one thing is the translation, but then it's revised so you have the King James, then you have the New King James Version, then you have the, uh, the, the NIV, then you have the NIV 1993, 1999, and then you have, you see what I'm saying? So there's translations and then there's revisions or versions. The third criteria for evaluating a Bible translation, I hope somebody's learning something. Third criteria is the language and the audience. Again, if King James would have been from New York... You might see somewhere in there, forget about it. I don't know. 
right? And Jesus turned around to the 12 and said, forget about it. I don't know. It might say that. So you got to take into consideration the language and the audience. I kind of went into that already, the whole versions and the fact that English today is a little different than English 100 years ago. And English 100 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come back, will be a little bit different than it is today. So it's important to understand this because English is a living, an alive language. By the way, um, the... The German Bible is powerful. It's the word of God. But if you don't speak German, I don't recommend that one. Because the best version is the read version and the understood version. So we are blessed. We have translations to choose from. What a shame to not use all of them. Personally, personally, me, Pastor Rich. I, I, understand, I understand a lot of the King James because I grew up in church. And I grew up with the King James Version. and Reina Valera Version. So I get it. I get it. But I realized at one point in my life, I really understand better the NIV. I like the NIV. But I like both. So I have a King James. I have an NIV. I have an NLT. Okay, let's go into that. Three categories of Bible translations. Three categories of Bible translations. Come on. Give somebody an elbow. Say, this is good. All right. Three categories of Bible translations. Here's the first one. There's the first, I'm, I'm teaching you here, formal equivalency. So there's formal equivalency tra Bible translations, also known as exact equivalency, which is word for word. Some examples of this are the King James Version, the New King James Version, obviously the American, uh, the New American Standard Bible, NASB, and the ESV, English Standard Version. These are, these are formal equivalency, exact equivalency, word for word translation. Now we also have functional equivalency. Functional equivalency is known as dynamic equivalency, which is more thought for thought. Thought for thought. Uh, examples of this are the New Living Translation, the Good News Bible, of course, the, uh, the NIV. Although the New International Version could kind of be between formal and functional, but that's a different style. Then third, we have free translation, also known as paraphrasing, where it's more of an idea for idea. If you've ever read the Message or the Living Bible, it's, it, it says it's a paraphrase. Right? And those, by the way, aren't, aren't using manuscripts. Those are paraphrasing current English versions. So, so these are three types uh, of Bible translations. My recommendation is use all three. If you're doing a Bible study because you want to present a biblical study, you want to present a devotional teaching, use formal equivalency and check the functional equivalency. If you want devotional and just kind of understand it, let the Lord speak to you, check out the, the, the paraphrase. I wouldn't use just the paraphrase and not use the other ones because, again, it's more of a, more of a thought for th idea for idea. So there's a little bit of difference, but they're all saying the same heart. Are you with me? I could ask you right now, hey, uh, say, this, say this to me. And if you're from New York, you might say it in one way. If you're from California, you might say it another way. And if you're from England, you might say it another way. But you're all saying the same thing, but you're saying it in different ways. Okay? So these are the Bible translations. Let me give you guys a quick example. And you don't have to look it up. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you just because time's sake. 1 Corinthians 13.4, King James Version. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. <laughs> hey, hey, by the way, some people love their KJV. Love your KJV, but don't make other people feel bad or, die or demonic because they don't love your KJV the same way you do. <laughs> if, suffer if. And the vaunteth. <laughs> By the way, word for word translation is, is tricky because in Greek there are various words for love. We just have love every time in First Corinthians 13. But in the Greek they have filio, phileo, they have agape, they have stergos, and they have eros. So, we, so again, the word for word is hard because we're just using love. And in the Greek there's four different words. First Corinthians 13, 4, NIV. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Like, like those of you who have kids and grandkids, which one do you think they're going to lean towards? Right? They might like, you know, the puffeth. 
1 Corinthians 13, 4, message. This is, now this is a paraphrase, free translation. Love never gives up. I, I would add a yo. Love never gives up, yo. <laughs> love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. doesn't have a swelled head. Are you seeing? Are you seeing? You seeing? So same verse, different styles of translations. Who's to say that this is the only, you know, again, if you want to, preach to this generation and people who never picked up a Bible, charity suffereth long, that, that it's going to feel like they're watching a Shakespeare, right? Like, but if you grew up with that, you're like, God, charity suffereth long. That's my jam, you know? <laughs> but I'm not going to tell others that they're wrong because this is what I, this is the real. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Second thing, so, so, so basically get a translation that you, that you understand and like. The second thing I said is get a study Bible. You want to take some more dips? Get a study Bible. This is a study Bible I have here. This is an NIV study English for me. And, and it has Bible, regular Bible verses, but then on the bottom here, it just has notes. Like it has extra. It has context. Sometimes there's articles in between about this, this, and that. It goes deeper. You want to you wanna really, like not just read the Bible, but let the Bible read you like, like, and get in it. Man, that. Half the time, preachings that I prepare, Bible studies that I do, devotionals that I share, they, I, they come from just reading the, 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 oh, man, I get it. I see what he's saying. It makes sense to me because it's a study Bible. You want to go deeper? You want the word to dwell richly in you? Get a study Bible. Study the word. Read the extra commentary. There's all kinds in different versions because there's study Bibles in the version that you prefer. There's even special ones like the Life Application Bible, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, the John Maxwell Leadership Bible that has leadership teachings connected to biblical teachings. Like, there's so many great options out there. Third thing, if you want to take a dip, deeper dip, get in a life group. Get in a life group. Get in a small group. We call them life groups here at Vertical Church. Get in one. Don't, just, don't just, just read it. Don't just hear it on Sunday when you come to church. Actually talk about it. Man, look what I was reading. Or look what we're learning. Like get connected with other people who start to appreciate and love. And now you're with other people who are also letting the word of God dwell richly in them. You can't. Listen, you cannot allow the word to dwell richly in you and stay the same. Look, 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 look. A dip or two. Every once in a while, I come to church. That's good. But, but when, the, when the word of God dwells richly, you're not the same of what you used to be. And it's evident because what's in you changes you. What's in you transforms even what you look like, what you sound like, what you smell like, what you taste like. It's different. It's God in you because you, you allow the word of, God, of Christ to dwell richly in you. What a great illustration to see it. A lot of us are here. We want to make that next jump. Allow the word of God to dwell in you. Get in a life group. By the way, life group, season, fall season, life groups, September 5th, week, week of September 5th, all the way through the end of November, practically thanks, uh, Thanksgiving. It's our season. If you're new here, we do life groups, which means not just Sundays at church, but we do church in homes by saying we have studies, we have activities, all kinds of life groups. Anybody ever been blessed by a life group here at Vertical Church? Man, there's some great life groups. I love this. You know, I was talking actually to, to Craig who was telling me that Craig, Craig and Pam, they had a Bible Basics life group that they've been doing a couple, couple semesters. And some people were like, oh, man, we felt good last week because we already learned a lot of that in that life group. Man, there's all kinds of groups for you to be a part of. And I want to encourage you, get connected because it will help you get deeper into God's word. By the way, life group directory, next Sunday, life group directory is going to be released. So if you're a life group leader and the Lord is, is telling you today through this message that you need to lead a life group, life group leader, register it today. Register it today. You don't have to have all the details, but register it today because we want to include it on the directory, which will come out next Sunday. That's going to be awesome. All right, understanding the Bible. Anybody having fun yet? Come on, tell somebody next to you, say, you look younger today. You look younger. Come on, tell them. Open up to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. You, you know how you respond to that? When somebody says that to you, you say, you, say, you speak the truth. <laughs> or, you could say, or if you have a preference, you could, be, you could say, you speak if the truth if. <laughs> if you're a KJV, that's it. Open, open to uh, 2 Timothy 3. Can I, can I just say something? We're talking about understanding the Bible. So, so my goal is... For people, some of you who've never really cared about it, never known about it, never heard about it, and then some of you who did grow up all around it, but it's just not in you, because you can grow up, you can grow up all around something and it's not in you. 
I, I really want you to understand the Bible. Because the truth is this. There is no relationship unless there is understanding. If I truly want my, my relationship with my wife to thrive, I have to learn to understand her. And vice versa. That reminds me of a joke. You guys, you guys so, so this guy in California, he, find, he finds this old magic lamp. And he like rubs it and a genie comes out. Jeannie's like, hey, you have one wish. What do you want? And the guy's like, man, you know what? I'm scared of planes and flying, so I've always wanted to go to Hawaii, but I'm scared, so I can't. Can you build me a bridge from California to Hawaii so that I can go and not have to get on a plane? And the genie's like, okay, hold up. Do you know what, that's, do you know what, do you know what this entails? The amount of construction and, and, and all that stuff from California to Hawaii. You know, I, I think you need to reconsider your wish. And the guy's like, okay, all right, can you help me? understand my wife and the genie's like okay do you want one lane or two all my husbands out there brothers gotta help you out I'm helping you out just a joke it's just a joke don't get mad at him it's just a joke all right all right so check it out let me, let me just let me just let me just read a few points that are going to come up on screen here the Bible, some of this I shared last week, the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years in over a dozen countries on three continents by at least 40 people in three different languages. Check out this next thing. The Bible was written by poets, prophets, farmers, kings, soldiers, shepherds, princes, priests, historians, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars, businessmen, and doctors. The Bible was written in caves, ships, palaces, prisons, and deserts. Here's the question. How did they all come up with the same story? 1,500. Like if I just say, hey, I want you and you and you to do this. Like I'm going to get three whole co completely different. Who, saw, who was a witness to the accident? I saw it. I saw it. Well, he came. No, no, no. She came. 1,500 years, 40 different people. And the same thing. You want to know why? There's only one author of the Bible. His name is God. The only way that this happens is God. And that's why you have 2 Timothy right there, 3 verse 16. It might be highlighted from last week. It may be if you have your same Bible. And it says all scripture. How much? All scripture is God breathed and is useful. What is it useful for? For teaching. Hey, 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 by the way. Sometimes I'm going to teach you as your pastor, and you will teach people that you're discipling. It's also good for rebuking. Hey, hey, sometimes God has to rebuke us. Do you have a teachable heart? And sometimes for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that's you and me, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. Not just so-so, like thoroughly equipped. The Bible speaks to every area of your life. Anytime you and I are facing something in our lives, the first question should be, what does God's word say about this? The first question is not, what does my wife say? Or what is my, or, you know, what is my psychiatrist? The first question is not, what, is, what does CNN say? What does Fox say? That's not, the first question is, what does God's word say to me? I want to close off with a few thoughts on kind of like, what's, what's the Bible all about? Let me give you kind of, I want to give you a little bit of a, a summarized story. I, I, I learned this and I thought it was really cool. It's the plot of the Bible and it's, it's called the mirror image. And I'm going to use kind of like the Old Testament and the New Testament kind of mirror each other in God's plan from beginning to end. Are you guys with me? I'm going to, uh, production team did a great job, uh, helped me set this up. So, so let, me, let me start explaining and you're going to see the diagram come up behind me. It all began, began with God and righteous people in paradise. This is where it began. By the way, where do you find that in the Bible? Genesis. Genesis. God and righteous people in paradise. It's the Garden of Eden in Genesis. But then, but then Satan and sin enter the world. Genesis 3, by the way. And every time that Satan enters, two things happen. Separation from God and chaos in your life. Every time. And God says, I can't have this, so the world is judged and destroyed. That sound familiar? 
Noah's Ark, the flood. Now, after that, the world eventually and humans get back into chaos again. And now humans try to put together the chaos. How do they do it? By trying to establish a one world government system. Tower of Babel, where they become this fortified city and they're building up to heaven basically to say, we're going to reach God because we want to be God for ourselves. One world government system. Tower of Babel. And God says, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to use my system. So what God does is he puts together his system, which is the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, which are God's holy people. Now, this is a great, great thing and a great moment in history. However, the problem was that they were given laws on tablets. And the situation is that those laws didn't get into them. Those laws remained external. They didn't get into them. It wasn't internal, so it didn't work. In comes God's plan and the whole focus of the Bible, right at the top and at the center. Jesus is the center of the Bible. Jesus is the focus of the Bible. So enters in Jesus. Why is he at the top and the center? Because it's all about him. After Jesus came and he lived his life, by the way, where do we find that in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, New Testament, the Gospels, Jesus' life, right? After he comes in and he, God establishes a new order through the, the, how does he do it now? Now it's not the 12 tribes. Now he does it through the 12 disciples, the, the church, God's holy people. And what's going to happen eventually, by the way, Revelation talks about it, is, and by the way, I think we're already living, we're living in a time where humanity is basically saying, you know what, we don't, not, God, we don't need you. We can do this on our own. That's the society and culture we're living in. It's, gonna, it's only going to get worse, biblically speaking, especially if you read Revelation. I mean, think about it. We don't need you to tell us if we're men or women or boys or girls. Like, we can be whatever we want to be. We can decide. We can be God. We can decide what's right, what's wrong. And what happens is it's going to come back again to a one-world government system. Signs of end times. This, this is what the Bible is all about. And what's going to happen? Once again, once again, the world is going to be judged and destroyed. You can find that in Revelation. Now the difference is when God destroys the world this time, Satan and sin will have to exit. This is where we start spelling victory. He's going to be thrown into a bottomless pit, Satan, and we are now going to rule and we're going to reign with King Jesus, but it's not going to be God and righteous people. It's going to be God and redeemed people. Where? In paradise. It's always been God's heart from the beginning. God with his people in paradise to the end. God with redeemed people in paradise. But you know who's at the center of it all? He's the center. In fact, if you're taking notes, the subject of the Bible is Jesus. All right, right, go to John 5. Go to John 5. I don't want to get anybody cramps, cramps in your fingers. I know it's new for some of you. Twiddle your fingers with John 5. I beat you. I know. I beat you. The subject of the Bible is Jesus. So, hey, a little tip. When you read the Bible, try to find Jesus in there. Try to find Jesus. By the way, he's the subject of the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Oh, pastor, he must be the subject of the Bible in the New Testament because that's when he comes in. No, he's always been. He's always been. That's why he made a statement to the Pharisees, you may have this verse highlighted too. John 5, 39. You got it? I'm going to read New Living Translation. So Jesus, if you have a red letter Bible, these might be red because this is Jesus talking. He says to the religious leaders, you search scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life. They were reading scriptures to have more information in their head. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Pause. What scriptures was Jesus talking about there? The Old Testament. Because the New Testament hadn't come out yet. He's still living it. (laughs) They haven't written it. So he's talking about the Old Testament. He's saying, they all point to me. Jesus is the center. From the beginning, the Old Testament, Genesis, to Malachi, to Matthew, to Revelation. So now we know the subject of the Bible, Jesus. The question is, what's the verb of the Bible? Like, what's the action of the Bible? Go back two to three pages to John 3. Anybody, anybody know that one? John 3, 16. That's a good one to highlight. 
Some people call it the heart of the Bible. John 3, 16. I'm going to read the NIV. Is anybody there? For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. <laughs> he didn't just have it, he gave it. By the way, when I ask for the verb of the Bible, some people will say love, and I'll say close. Here it is, the verb of the Bible is give. The verb of the Bible is give. Because for God so loved that he gave. God so loved that he gave. And that, brothers and sisters, that is why giving is our response. We actually do what God modeled for us and what we actually know that we have to do. So I read the Bible to find Jesus. Jesus is the subject. I identify that the verb of the Bible is give, and that's what we now do in response. We give our lives to him. We give our hearts to him, our talents, our abilities, our passions, our time, our money, our best. We give it to him. Hey, hey, let's go to 1 John 3.16. Pastor, that's a trick. Are you trying to trick me? No. There are three letters that are 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. They're close to the end. These are the general epistles written by John. So that's a different book. Listen to me. John is a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But now we're going to 1 John 3.16, which is one of the short letters written by John. Did anybody get there? Anybody had no idea? I didn't know there was another book called John. Now you know. 1 John. Here's where we find our response. 1 John 3, 16, and it says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is what the Bible is all about. He gave, so we give. And by the way, you know what I've discovered? That it's possible to give without loving. But it's impossible to love without giving. And so this is my call to you today. That, whew, that you would let the word of God not mini dip in you that you would let the word of God not just oh yeah kind of yeah you would let the word of God dwell richly abundantly in you to such point that you're not who you used to be you look different you sound different you respond different because you are you're alive in Christ and the word of God is transforming you Word of God, people died so that one day, Tyndale's last words when he was, he was killed for translating the, the Bible into English by the, by, the, by the English government and the Roman Catholic Church. And when he, when he was right about to be killed in that moment, after being detained, I think, for, for over a year, he said, may God open the eyes of the King of England. It seems like some years later when King James stepped in, that happened. And, and, I, and I think we are so blessed that we have sometimes multiple Bibles in our homes. You know, there's 7,000 languages in the world. The Bible's translated in 3,500 of them. And right now there's a project called the Illuminations Problem, Illuminations Project to try to get it translated in all those other 3,500 languages. Because there's not a full Bible in those 3,500 languages. We have, we have not only a full Bible, we have versions and translations and and then how foolish to be like, don't use that one. This is the only, like, what? Praise God. My suggestion, use all of them. If you want to do a deep study of the Bible, use formal equivalency ones. In fact, go to the Greek if you want to. If you want to, if you want to just kind of have a devotional and be refreshed, use a, use a translation, a, a paraphrase translation. 
but use them all. Enjoy them all. It's God's word. Lord, I pray that we would have a love for your word. I pray that we would have a love, a newfound love and respect and passion for your word. That we would not forget the lives of people who literally died so that we could have Bibles that we can understand in our own languages. Thank you for that blessing. Thank you for the King James Version. Thank you for the New International Version, for the New Living Translation, for the ESV, for the NASB. Thank you for the message. Thank you for all of them, Lord. Thank you for the Living Bible. Thank you for the Geneva Bible. Thank you for every Bible, Lord. Point us to you. We honor you. We bless you. And I pray, Lord, that your word would dwell richly in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you learned something today. I want to do one final prayer because this is what the Lord kind of spoke to my heart. It's possible that your life feels like it's in chaos. And maybe you feel separated or far from God. And remember I said, I said when I was explaining the story of the Bible is that whenever Satan and sin come in, it causes two things, separation from God and chaos in our life. And maybe right now you're experiencing either, both, a fraction of some of those things. And I encourage you to think and consider maybe, maybe sin has entered. Maybe the enemy has been attacking. And I'm here to tell you that you can find peace for your soul, your spiritual life find peace. But the peace is only in Christ Jesus. It's in his word. The Bible talks about the message that transforms lives, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the good news we just read in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not die spiritually or perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. That's a promise for every person who believes in Jesus, who confesses his name, Romans 10, 9, who confesses it with their mouth and believes it in their heart, that even though I'm a sinner because I messed up, and every one of us are, in his grace, in his, in his mercy and love, for, in his forgiveness, we can be forgiven and be saved and be activated in our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we want for every person. So if you're far from God, you can get close today. If you don't know him, you can take the first step today to begin to know him. And if you know him but you've strayed, this is a good day to recommit, reconcile, and reconnect your relationship with God. So I'm going to invite everybody to say this prayer for the benefit of people who say, maybe this is my first time, I need to do this today. Or prodigals who say, I'm coming back. I've been far from home. Amen. Close your eyes, bow your head one last time. If you say today, you know what, Pastor Verge, I, I realize that, that I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. This moment is for you. If you're online, we invite you to pray this prayer as well. And maybe you say, I, I just, I'm, I'm tired of the chaos, and I'm tired of feeling far from God and lost spiritually. This is your moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you say, you know what, Pastor Virgin, include me in that prayer today. Just raise your hand real quick. I want to know who I'm praying with here today. If that's you for that, for say that prayer. I see it. One, two. Anybody else says, this is my decision today? Three. Anybody else? Praise God. You can put your hands down. Let's pray. Everybody say with me, thank you, God, for speaking to my life today. I recognize that I need you because I'm a sinner. Thank you for loving me that you would pay the price for my sins. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask for forgiveness. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe it in my heart. And I confess it with my mouth. You died and rose so that I could live. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Work in my life. Dwell in me, Lord. May your word dwell in me. Transform me. Renew my mind. Help me, Lord. Thank you, God, for loving me, for forgiving me, and for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Best decision. Hands down. Best decision. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today or recommitted your life to Jesus, we are, that is our answered prayer. And you are a walking, living, answered prayer. And uh, we're so proud of you. If you don't have a spiritual family or home, we're here for you. Uh, 
our doors are open for you. Let us know. The best way for us to know is, is by actually getting a connection card. There's a connection card in every seat back pocket. It helps us to really have a documented decision. And, and if you're watching online or you want to do a virtual decision card, send the word Jesus1 to the number 94,000 text message and fill out a digital decision card. We're going to close off service by honoring the Lord, and we're going to activate part of what the Bible calls us to do, which is to give, right? It's so much more that God wants from us, but, but we honor the Lord here with, with the, what he's given us, with our treasures. Um, it's all his, but we honor him by giving him our first and best 10%. That's called a tithe. Um, and God works in that. He blesses that. So if this is your spiritual home, I want to encourage you to honor the Lord with your tithe. Um, if you're visiting us, you're our guest, don't feel any obligation. We don't expect that from you. Um, and, you know, if the Lord puts on your heart to, to go above and beyond to offerings, you know, tithes and offerings, when I give above and beyond, the Lord blesses that. And I want to encourage you to believe and trust his promises in that. Um, last thing before I pray, um, on your way out, we have a little gift for you. It's a bookmark. And it has... How to Read My Bible, SOAP Method for Bible Reading, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. Next week, I'm going to teach this and talk a little bit more about this, uh, SOAP Method of just how to get more out of your Bible when you sit down and read it. Make sure you take a uh, bookmark as a gift on your way out. Uh, let's stand to our feet. Let's pray. There are envelopes in the seat back pockets if you want to prepare a tithe and offering. There are wooden boxes on the walls as you go out of the auditorium and also in the lobby. You can drop off your tithes and offerings. And if you're online, you can go to verticalchurch.com or use our app. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to learn about your word. We want to we wanna allow, we want to let your word, Christ, dwell richly in us. We need you and we want you. Speak to our hearts. Bless the cheerful giver and everything we've brought to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have leaders up in the front ready to pray for you, pray with you. If you need prayer, do not hesitate. Come forward and receive prayer. Amen. Let's worship. that you're here and we hope that you have a good week. Blessings everyone.